Good morning to everyone. I'm John Levy, and it's my distinct honor to serve as the 10th chair of the Board of the Legal Services Corporation. And on behalf of our board, I want to thank you for taking part in this important video briefing on the extraordinary COVID-19 health crisis that has us coming together this morning in this virtual way and its significant impact on civil legal needs and state courts. We will be privileged to hear remarks from distinguished speakers who very much understand the importance of civil legal assistance to the fabric of our democracy. Senator Dan Sullivan of Alaska, co-chairs of the Congressional Access to Civil Legal Services Caucus, Representatives Joseph Kennedy of Massachusetts and Fred Upton of Michigan, ABA's President Judy Perry Martinez and Ken Frazier, the CEO of Merck and a co-chair of LSE's Leaders Council. Our briefing also features two panels this morning. The first brings together the leaders of five LSC grantees to discuss the impact that COVID-19 is having on legal aid providers and their clients. In the second panel, four state Supreme Court Chief Justices will discuss how COVID-19 is affecting their courts and access to justice. As our country struggles with the public health emergency sparked by COVID-19, LSE and its grantees are bracing for an emerging civil legal aid crisis that unfortunately will only deepen in the days to come. Other resourced civil legal aid organizations were already falling well short of being able to meet the majority of their clients' needs despite their very best efforts. Indeed, last year, LSE conducted an intake census of all of its grantees, and during a four-week four period, found that 42% of the legal problems presented received no service of any kind, and only 27% of the eligible problems presented were served fully because of a lack of resources. Now, LSE's grantees are facing surging demand as low-income Americans seek unemployment insurance, fight unlawful evictions and foreclosures, struggle to access health care, send off scams, and try to obtain protective orders to respond to the spike in domestic, elder, and child abuse. And as social distancing and other COVID prevention measures take their toll on the economy, unemployment will continue to climb, pushing up the number of people who need and qualify for assistance from LSE-funded organizations. This would be a daunting threat in the best of times, but this is not the best of times for many of our grantees who are being battered by funding cuts. The Federal Reserve's under understandable decision to lower interest rates close to zero is undermining an important source of funding for civil legal aid, interest on lawyer trust accounts, IALTA. Well, these accounts provided $65 million to LSD's grantees in 2018, over 5% of their budgets. And in some states, those funds played an even bigger role. In Ohio, for example, the Ohio Access to Justice Foundation had expected interest to cover nearly a third of its budget this year. And in Michigan, interest in court fees provided almost a quarter of the budgets of the state's legal aid providers in 2018. And those court fees are also declining now across the country as so many courts are closed due to the crisis. The economic turmoil will also likely affect state and local appropriations as well as grantees fundraising efforts in the coming months and years. The National Association of IALTA programs expect its members' revenues to drop significantly from $370 million 
generated in 2018, in some states falling by as much as 75%. And while we at LSC are grateful for the 50 million we were appropriated in the recently enacted CARES Act, clearly much more is needed. And LSC is seeking another 50 million in leg legislation now under consideration. Look folks, this is not a pretty picture, but we have faced dire circumstances before. In fact, the Great Recession of 2008 posed many of the same funding issues, including near zero interest rates that gutted IALTA programs at that time across the country and led to the housing court a foreclosure crisis that affected so many of our country's low-income families and our grantees. But we soldiered on, and our grantees replaced lost financial resources with resourcefulness, which has always been the strong suit of the men and women who work so hard at the organizations that LSC supports. Through their imagination and determination and the never wavering commitment of the LSC board, we weathered that storm, just as we will weather this one. We are about to hear discussions of some of the innovations grantees and the state courts have already developed to deal with the legal challenges of COVID-19. If there's a silver lining in this particular storm, it is these efforts and the ones that will undoubtedly follow. One of the remarkable executive directors we are about to hear from, Laura Tuggle, who heads Southeast Louisiana Legal Services, serves a community that has certainly been battered by major storms in the past few years. Interviewed just the other day, Laura made this inspiring observation, and I quote her. So we're going to be here. We ain't going nowhere, she insisted. We may not look the same. We may not be your mama's civil legal aid, but we're definitely going to be here, unquote. Well, I know that Laura was really speaking for all of our grantees. And we at LSC, we at LSC are going to be here too. On behalf of all of our grantees, and our country. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce the moderator of our first panel, Lynn Jennings, LSC's Outstanding Vice President of Grants Management. Lynn. Great, thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lynn Jennings, as, as John said, and uh, we have a lot of ground to cover in the next half hour, so I'll get into it and introduce our panelists, and uh, then we'll get started. First, I'd like to welcome Ron Rasmussen, who's the Executive Director of Legal Services in New York City. Then we have Ashley Lowe, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Lakeshore Legal Aid. Cesar Torres, who's the Executive Director of the Northwest Justice Program located in Washington State. Laura Tuggle from Southeast Louisiana Legal Services, and Monica Vegas Patan, who is the Executive Director of Greater Miami Legal Services. My first question to the panel is a two parter. Uh, what's been the greatest challenge in getting your staff to work remotely? And what is the greatest challenge in serving clients right now? So we're going to kick it off with Ron. Good morning, Ron. Good morning, Lynn, and uh, good morning, John, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about uh, the COVID crisis and what we are all uh, experiencing in our own communities. New York City, I think many of you know, has a population of about 8 million, 1.7 million of whom are under the poverty line. So that's $24,000 for a family of four. We've had 100,000 plus corona cases here in New York <clears throat> and more than 10,000 deaths in New York City alone. So we are really experiencing this crisis up close and personal every day. We have a staff of about 600 
in 15 offices throughout the city. We told everyone to start working from home on March 12th and closed our offices on Tuesday, March 17th, right after the courts were closed. Pretty much overnight, we had to turn into a, a law firm that was working from home. Overnight, we mobilized our entire team, determined who could and could not work from home, and deployed over 150 laptops, printers, and my files to ensure that everyone could do what they needed to do on behalf of our clients and on behalf of new clients who were calling us with coronavirus-related crises. Our access line remained open, serving clients from their homes. We have 12 staff who speak over 16 languages. They continue to work. And of course, our first obligation was to our existing clients who we were able to serve immediately because uh, our IT and operations staff allowed us to have access to all of our client records and files. We began by um, providing a lot of emergency services, clients who were being evicted by their landlords illegally, evicted by roommates, clients who were having additional problems with, uh, with uh, domestic violence. We were able, even though the courts were closed for non-essential matters, to address those matters first in person, which was a scary thing for our clients and staff to go to court, but then fairly quickly the courts turned to all remote operations, so we were able to work with, represent our clients there. The, uh, we have experienced a 50% increase in unemployment insurance cases, a 35% increase in food stamp cases, and a 150% increase in in callers with public benefits emergencies. I'll just say two quick things in closing. The first is that uh, our social workers put together almost immediately an emergency fund that would make monies available for those of our clients who had no access to any money at all to support their most basic needs. And then finally, of course, as the executive director, I've had to think a lot about what it means to have a stable organization both now and going forward like like not-for-profits and for-profits are doing all over the country right now we heard from john a little a minute ago that the iola funds are being uh slashed we heard from our own iola fund that their interest rates had had plummeted we know the post recession the iola fund went from 36 million down to 6 million pretty much overnight back in 2009 and 2010 that's likely to happen here in New York State. We have already learned that $20 million of our city funding has been reduced. The governor has reserved the right to cut the budget further at the end of April and at the end of June, and we're anticipating cuts there. So we're incredibly grateful for Congress and for legal services support for our work. Great, thank you very much, Ron, and thank you for keeping it at, within time. Ashley, I'm gonna to turn to you now, and you can tell us how things uh, look in uh, another epicenter of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, which is the Detroit area. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so Lakeshore has about 125 staff members. We're spread out over 11 offices throughout Southeast Michigan. Uh, and one of those offices, several of those offices are in the city of Detroit, which has been hit incredibly hard. Um, one of our offices is a hotline. That hotline provides advice and brief service to the other legal aid programs throughout the state. Um, and so that was a critical part of the infrastructure, making sure that hotline was open as the state started to close down. Um, the good news is we were in a good position uh, to go remote. We had all of our systems are cloud-based, so uh, that transition wasn't a monumental one. Um, we'd even been piloting taking remote calls on our hotline uh, starting in the, in the beginning of the year. We were trying to uh, fill in uh, staffing for peak times, and so uh, we developed the software and the tools ready to implement remote hotline calls as well. Um, luckily, we were a little bit ahead of the, of the curve in the technology side. Um, we encourage people to start working from home about 10 days before the governor issued the stay at home order in Michigan. So we were able to survey our staff, make sure everybody had uh, computers and headsets and web cameras. And so all those orders to get that technology in 
were made before the, the inundation of all the rest of the state going remote. So we were able to get that technology out to our staff in time for when uh, the state was closed down. Um, so some of our biggest challenges have been around training and communication. Um, every day there is something new that we need to train around. Um, we didn't do a lot of unemployment insurance cases at Lakeshore before this crisis. And obviously that has um, been the bulk of our work since this crisis has happened. Um, we've had tools that we were using or had available that people didn't really take advantage of. Uh, we use Office 365 and, um, and we had teams available to us, but nobody really used it in a meaningful way. Uh, and now I feel like we're all experts in it and setting up video blogs and, um, and webinars that we're all doing our own uh, and doing communication with each other. Uh, there's new things that have come up. Um, electronic signings we had to figure out how to do. Uh, witnessing documents remotely, all these things have become available because our governor and our Supreme Court have been very progressive in providing these tools and allowing us to uh, work remotely and really be effective, but we've had to learn how to do it. Um, in addition, our uh, recently our Supreme Court encouraged video hearings, and so we had a training on Friday about how to conduct those hearings. Um, I think communication with staff is another issue that we're really focusing on increasing the frequency of that communication so that our staff feel connected and they don't feel um, like they're all alone in this fight. The work that we do is hard. Uh, it is hard to talk to clients and hear the stories that they are, they're sharing. And so to be able to connect with each other on a regular basis has been really important. Um, we have increased, I do video uh, messages to our staff and webinars every week, and our supervisors are making sure to touch base with their staff on a daily basis so that we know our staff is supported and ready to move forward um, and help our clients. Um, one of the biggest uh, challenges that we're facing in terms of client services is letting know, uh, clients know that we're here. When our governor issued our stay-at-home order back in March, um, one of the essential services was not legal services. So people have assumed that legal aid offices are closed. Uh, and so that's a message that we are trying to get ahead of, uh, get around and let people know we're really here uh, and available. So our office is never closed. We were able to go remote immediately with our hotline and that's open. Um, and I'm trying to spread that word. I've been on some talk shows. I've been uh, getting interviewed by uh, a variety of media. We're doing social media outreach and um, all of our lawyers are spreading the word through their contacts in the community uh, to let people know that we're available We've even added our contact information on court websites, um, and we work very closely with our state's self-help website to make sure that clients who are going on to get questions, uh, who have questions about unemployment insurance, uh, that those folks are getting directed to our hotline and to our online application uh, immediately so we can get them right in and get them support. Great, thank you very much, Ashley. Let's move on to uh, Laura in Louisiana. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we thought we were much more ready to go remote than it turned out we were because of all the disasters that we've gone through over the years. Um, we were in a much better place than we were 15 years ago when Katrina stuck, struck because we had a lot of we had cloud-based software now. We had the ability to text clients through our case management system. We had a voice over internet phone system. Uh, we just had a lot of tools that we wouldn't have otherwise had. So our attorneys were pretty much ready for the most part to work remotely and were more used to working remotely, but our support staff were not. Um, and so one of the first things that we had to do when we realized uh, the potential impact of COVID-19 that was on March 13th, schools closed on March 16th, courts closed on March 16th. So over that weekend, my deputy uh, and I decided, ready or not, we have to go remote to protect our clients and our, and our staff and their families. And so we scrambled to get uh, software in place, uh, electronic document signing software. We got that in time. We ordered about 25 laptops. We have 105 staff. So we had some additional staff that needed those services. We did a remote work readiness survey of our staff to find out who has internet at home, 
who has unlimited minutes on cell phones, um, all kinds of other remote wet readiness capabilities. And uh, on March 17th, we went 100% uh, remote work in our New Orleans office, and the next day our other five offices went remote. Um, we had about 15% of our staff that were embedded with community partners at medical legal partnerships or domestic violence shelters or homeless shelters um, and other off-site locations. And so we uh, are continuing those services, mostly through um, email referrals or phone, phone referrals. Uh, we set up a COVID-19 legal helpline, which we didn't previously have. Um, obviously, but we've used the same number in prior disasters. So it's just a number that we keep to activate when there is a disaster. So we launched that towards the end uh, of March and have really been pushing that out to the media. Uh, we've been doing a lot of trainings of our staff um, and we've had a few staff volunteered or either get voluntold uh, that they need to be helping our staff, other staff who need some additional technical assistance in using technology. We've been making a lot of short videos for staff. Here's how you do this, here's how you do that, and posting that so that they can uh, more efficiently work remotely. I think one of our biggest challenges um, in reaching clients has been how do you do that when you can't see them? About 50% of our entire client um, intake in the New Orleans office was done through walk-ins. And folks would just kind of drop in whenever. And another of our offices has about the same level. So we started doing a couple of different things in trying to reach clients. We did a Facebook Live session, had never done one before right before April 1st when rent was due. And um, it had 4,300 viewers with only an hour's notice. So we've done a bunch of them since then and our lowest uh, viewership of that has been 1,000 people. Um, we do see our call volume go up. So we have to tell our hotline people, get ready because we're doing one of these sessions. So coordination and communications has been challenging. Uh, we're really concerned about how we reach people that don't have computers. And so just this morning, we had reached out to see if we could start circulating our flyers at a lot of the food banks and at the school-based feeding sites. And the City of New Orleans Emergency Preparedness Office said, yeah, sure, that's a great idea. How do we, how do we get that to you? Um, we're also reaching out through um, doing a lot more media to get the word out and um, reaching out to faith-based partners. Uh, we have a group of hospital chaplains and church nurses from eight, 853 churches in our greater, uh, greater regional area that are already organized through a local foundation. And we've reached out to that group um, to provide information. Great, thank you. Uh Cesar, uh, let's turn to you and what's going on in Washington State. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity. I also do want to thank uh, President Ron Flagg and the senior staff at LSC. I think they've been having a very proactive, agile response and, and we greatly appreciate the, their support. Um, I want to begin by saying that NJP has 240 employees in 18 locations, uh, physical offices, uh, primarily in rural areas around the state. And our offices are highly integrated into local communities, food banks, pro bono boards, uh, program boards, uh, shelters, uh, working with the courts. And so being present and being on the ground is a pretty fundamental aspect of, of uh, their work. Um, and at the same time, we do uh, work very hard to integrate our, all of our offices as a statewide law firm, both technologically uh, and substantively. So uh, we both had some very positive uh, uh, arrangements in place to help us with this. And we also are facing quite severe challenges because of the impact of the, of the stay at home orders. <clears throat> 
Um, Washington had the uh, unfortunate distinction of being the early center of the pandemic. Uh, on February 28th and 29th, the first two deaths uh, took place in near Seattle. Uh, by the 5th, a few days later, there were 68 cases and 19 deaths, but these were confined to two counties, two adjacent counties right in the Seattle area. The rest of the counties had zero cases at that point in time. Uh, but as soon as we uh, saw the, uh, the deaths take place by, by March 3rd, that Tuesday, our, our, our management team determined that we had to begin transitioning and moving uh, our entire operation to, to remote work, prioritizing, first of all, uh, at risk, uh, high risk staff. Um, which we defined to include uh, staff who may have household members who are at high risk, as well as our clear hotline and our screening process. We have a statewide hotline, which is a mainstay of, of services across the state. Um, frankly, uh, on March 6th at an all staff meeting, uh, I've had all staff meetings, town halls through video Skype every Friday since March 6th. Uh, at our March 6th uh, first town hall, when we announced the, the beginning of the move to remote work, uh, there were some staff who quite didn't understand. There were no cases in their county. There were no cases anywhere else in the state, practically. Um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, folks were extremely concerned. Um, what we kept emphasizing is that we are, we want to make sure that everyone will be able to work and be available to serve clients and support the delivery of services. Uh, from home. <clears throat> By then, we had already uh, launched two surveys, one uh, as, as other programs did very quickly, but we had uh, launched two surveys, one to identify at-risk households in our staff, among our staff, and also uh, the technology issues, which proved to be quite daunting. Um, <clears throat> in addition to ordering 100 laptops, of which we've only received 50 as of right now, um, we also had to substantially um, enhance uh, some of our remote server capacity in order to be able to host the uh, clear, the hotline call center software and ensure that it was accessible remotely. Uh, you know, when, when in the office, the, the bandwidth issues uh, were quite different and having to make it available from home was a, a huge technological challenge. Um, which uh, we've been very successful. Our hotline volume of cases that uh, we're able to do has continued uh, pretty steadily. Um, <clears throat> um, the uh, biggest challenge, uh, I think, that, um, oh, and just to, uh, by the 16th, we have basically authorized all employees to work from home, and prior to that, we had also uh, given guidance that uh, allowed office, offices to put signs on their doors alerting uh, clients and walk-ins that uh, if they had any symptoms, they should stay away uh, and call us and, and try to make arrangements of that sort to try to protect staff. Um, some of the biggest challenges that we had in the transition, aside from the fact that uh, once we moved to remote and, and that happened the following week when the stay-at-home order came down, um, uh, obviously, we were cut off from clients. Uh, many of our local regional offices depend on walk-ins, and they also depend on referrals from the social service providers with whom we work closely and in partnership with. And they, too, were uh, now closed and having to struggle and find ways to work uh, at these uh, around the stay at home orders and, and how to, how they were delivering services was a challenge. And again, they were a mainstay of, of uh, connecting and referring clients to us. Our court system is not an integrated court system. And the, uh, uh, the court initially directed courts, the, the, the Supreme Court, uh, local courts to develop uh, uh, plans consistent with the health emergency uh, the courts were all over the map. So even as we were transitioning to remote and even as the stay in place order was initially starting to come down, um, the, the courts were uh, very um, inconsistent and very inattentive to the needs of 
for primarily our tenancy dockets, uh, and, 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 and so there was a huge struggle at the ground with each court as our officers tried to get their, their vicinages to respect and try to protect people's health on the one hand, and on the other hand, we were working uh, with coalition of other legal aid providers and public defenders at the state level to get a, a firmer, stronger emergency stay um, order from the Supreme Court, which we were successful right. in doing. I'm sorry to have to cut you off, Cesar, but I want to sure. head on over to Monica because sure. we do only have about 12 minutes of course. left. No, that's but fine. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Monica. Hi. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so in Miami-Dade, just to give you a quick update on Florida, we are as of today at 26,000 COVID cases and Miami-Dade itself is at 9,460. And our program, Legal Service of Greater Miami, serves both Miami-Dade and Monroe County, which has about an additional 70 cases. Uh, in terms of our team going remotely, as of March 16th, uh, we made the decision to work remotely. Uh, I made this uh, very clear to our staff, we are not closed. We are open and serving clients uh, virtually or remotely, whatever language you wanna use. In terms of our capacity to do that, we were at a huge advantage because in 2017, we were awarded a disaster grant through LSC that enabled us to invest significantly in hardware and software to be able to work remotely. We thought we were doing that in preparation for what would likely be a response to a hurricane disaster. Um, but because it enabled us to do move all of our phone system to a voice over IP cloud-based system so our, in, our phone intake can continue seamlessly. Um, so as of March 16th, we had all the attorneys. It was quick, it was easy. It was pick up their laptops and go home and, and work from home that way. Our other, the rest of our staff, which is about 50%, we have had to purchase laptops, but have been lucky in sort of moving that forward. And because I said our, we have both online and phone intake, uh, we've been able to continue to serve clients that way. Um, in terms of challenging challenges actually serving the clients beyond the operations of getting uh, our, our team to work from home, I think the biggest challenge has already been mentioned. It's ensuring that clients know that we are open and ready to serve our client community. Um, they, I think, understandably assume that we're, you know, an agency and we close like everything else. And uh, so getting that message out, we've been doing it through a variety of ways, obviously social media, traditional media, you know, we've been much more aggressive than we usually are in trying to reach out to local print and uh, local TV stations to get, and our attorneys have been doing interviews, topical interviews, not just this is legal services, but topical in terms of eviction issues and unemployment in Florida is a huge issue. It's well documented, the challenges with the system. And so getting media coverage on that, which in turn lets people know that the messaging that we're out there. Our website, like many programs, we've put up a COVID resource page. We've seen a 600% increase to our traffic to our website and the analytics indicate that it's because of the COVID page. Um, and just sort of gearing up, we also reached out uh, and had uh, with our, the rest of the programs in the state of Florida to make sure that we're messaging consistently. There are some statewide issues that are gonna be specific, you know, unemployment and eviction moratorium when it's lifted, those are state law issues. So make sure that we're collaborating. And then there's, we've reached out to our Access to Justice Commission, which has also posted us or Civil Legal Aid in general as a resource on their webpage. So making sure that we're sort of hitting all those potential touch points with clients um, Pre-COVID, there was 500,000 give or take eligible clients in our service area. Um, unfortunately, we anticipate that that is going to go up significantly. And so what we're doing uh, to prepare for that. Um, at present, in the last month, we just had, I just had somebody run numbers and it looks about 40% of the people that are contacting us are self-identifying that their legal problem is related to COVID-19. Um, and so, and that's with uh, courts, I would say quasi closed, given that they're doing video hearings and d different types of hearings. And most importantly, with an eviction moratorium right now in the state of Florida, pre COVID-19, 60% of the cases that came to us on a regular day were housing related. That is just unfortunately, I anticipate going to skyrocket after this, um, after the courts and the eviction moratorium is lifted because 
unfortunately, there's going to be this whole new population of individuals that are now eligible for our services. And so we're sort of gearing up for that and through training our staff, as Laura mentioned, and Ashley, there's these constant changes. And then also to the extent that we can really investing in pro bono and training up pro bono attorneys to get them ready and geared up to support us and our community when it's time. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Monica. We're going to wrap up the panel. It's a very short panel with a, a rapid fire uh, question for everybody, which is um, now that we're entering the next phase of this, uh, what is keeping you all up at night? And we're going to start with Ashley. Thanks, Lynn. This, this should be the longest part of the, the presentation. <laughs> but um, um, so I just to echo uh, the funding concerns, that's something as we move forward um, that we're, they're worried about as well. Um, as our state starts to talk about easing restrictions on the stay at home order um, and knowing that the eviction moratorium will eventually be lifted, uh, we're concerned about the onslaught of cases that are going to happen, certainly unemployment insurance cases, eviction, um, and domestic violence. There are not a lot of reports out there right now about domestic violence because people don't have any options and they're not able to go um, and leave their batterers. So we know there's going to be a lot of work to do around that. Um, as those things expand and really increase for us, um, our staff are dealing with kids who are out of school or out of daycare um, or dealing with um, having to take care of family or being sick themselves. Um, We've had a great uh, uh, opportunity with our private bar. They've been really generous with their volunteers to help. But I think as their uh, as courts open up and their regular work opens up again, uh, they're not going to be quite as available to us. So I'm worried about that kind of blowing up of cases uh, while staff is still um, at, a, at a reduced ability to respond to those needs and um, a, a limited number of volunteers to help us. Great, thank you. Laura, what is keeping you up at night? Putting aside the fiscal concerns, I worry the most about how we keep our staff safe while responding to what's going to be, our, I think, our biggest civil legal aid crisis that we've ever undergone uh, with our client population. And all the same issues that Ashley just worried about you know, definitely keep us worried. Um, but right now, the the most pressing that we're concerned about is the tsunami of evictions that is headed our way. Uh, even with an eviction moratorium on the books right now throughout the state, we've had to file, our staff have had to, you know, don face masks and go out with hand sanitizer on their hips and uh, just a sense of outrage that we're having to respond to, to so many illegal evictions. We've had to file 10 temporary restraining orders, which is not that easy to figure out how to do because of the limited court appearance. And they've required in-person contact, often in some pretty risky situations. Um, and so knowing what we're facing, even with a moratorium, um, and all the calls we're getting that we've been able to resolve informally. And we just got our mayor in New Orleans to issue um, guidance on Friday saying, hey, remember, nobody's supposed to be evicted right now and referring people to legal aid. Um, but, but that one is pretty daunting and just figuring out how we're gonna respond to it uh, because we know how huge it's going to be and how can we integrate volunteers and how do we do it all remotely uh, and keep that sense of mission and purpose and to keep people focused while keeping them safe is really um, what keeps us up right now. Great. Cesar, how about you? I, um, at my town hall last Friday, I began speaking with, with staff about the fact that in the next month or so, we're going to be having these moratoria lifted. The, the explosion that I referred to in, in my response to the survey uh, is frightening, uh, both at the eviction, with regards to eviction and so on. So this, this is a common uh, fear, I think, a really serious fear that we all have. But at the same time, I really started to lay the groundwork for that explosion is going to come and go with 
unemployment and, and so on. And then by September or October, we're going to be facing a multi-year intensification of poverty that is going to blow up our eligible population. Once the $600 extra unemployment goes away, um, the 1200 goes away to pay all this rent and so on and so forth. Um, the whole country is going to be in a fundamentally different situation economically, and it's going to take a long time for the economy to get back, and our lowest wage workers and so on are going to be in serious trouble. I have two other things I need to say. One is that right now we're struggling mightily trying to ensure that farm workers receive uh, protective gear, and it's an extremely difficult environment in which to do that, and the packing houses Agriculture is huge in Washington. We have farm workers in every corner of the state. And frankly, uh, it, it's not happening. And we're already starting to get uh, hot spots of COVID cases in, in among farm workers, which is going to begin to affect the food supply fundamentally. Um, and lastly, one of the worst things about this situation is how undocumented individuals are being treated. Not only are they the most vulnerable and being victimized in so many ways and abused in so many ways, but they have no civil legal aid recourse to speak of. And they're also being excluded from all of the relief packages that have been put down, including mixed households. If anyone is undocumented in the mixed household, and it's a horrible situation, but that keeps me up at night. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, Monica and then Ron. So apparently the same thing is keeping us up at night uh, for all the directors, but it is, I mean, it, just to echo their sentiments, it really is a concern that this is, we're dealing with this, what I'll call the sprint right now in terms of the health crisis right now, um, which understandably feels much, you know, it's, it's, it's scarier for people, for communities, and uh, it's a much higher risk than, than, than even someone losing their job or poverty because there's lives at stake. But once this passes at some point, we'll, hopefully it'll subside in some way in the next few months, the economic impact of this is gonna be a marathon and ensuring that the staff has the, the sort of the, the capacity both emotionally and just capacity in terms of numbers and financially as an organization that we have the capacity to deal with this and to staff it appropriately is definitely uh, what keeps me up at night, ensuring that we're planning for the future. And honestly, also the high level, very high level of uncertainty right now, talking to some people, leaders in our community that are usually our biggest financial supporters and still are talking about, you know, they're, even though they're not in a bad financial position right now, the high level of uncertainty makes it less likely that they're able to support us right now. And I know other directors are having those same conversations with their donors, and that's not something that's exclusive to legal aid. And that's going to be a huge challenge for our community going forward, you know, after this fiscal year. Thanks, Ron. Let's sure. uh, we'll wrap uh, it up with so, you. Okay, so our staff is incredibly remarkable, but we've never had a crisis like this that has driven us apart and not together. And it's clear from uh, what we know and, and what we see in the literature that the impact of this crisis is falling most heavily on people of color and women. The health impacts, the financial impacts, the educational impacts, and that's true for our staff as well, the majority of whom are people of color and women. So what keeps me up at night, in addition to all the things that have already been listed, is how can I and how can we as an organization continue to support the mental and physical health of our staff, many of whom are dealing with death in their own families and severe illness in their own families at the same time as they're trying to work from home and to help their kids connect with their educational opportunities. So um, we have to have healthy staff so that we can provide ag the aggressive, effective advocacy services that we know are gonna be needed uh, more and more uh, as a result of this crisis. Great, thank you. I wanna thank everyone who participated this morning. I know that your 
adaptability and innovation and amazing competence is making a huge difference. And uh, you're inspiring to us and uh, redoubles our commitment to what we do here in, uh, at LSC in Washington, DC. I'd like to uh, now throw it over to Frank Nooner, one of our board members who is going to introduce uh, the ABA president. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, my name is Frank Nooner, as Lynn said, and it's my pleasure to introduce my dear friend and my inspirational leader, Judy Perry Martinez. Uh, Judy is the president of the American Bar Association. Over the past 35 years, Judy has served in many capacities in the Amer leadership capacities in the American Bar Association and that have all dealt with critical issues in law and society. She's of counsel with the Simon Perigen, Smith and Red Firm Law Firm in New Orleans. Uh, Judy's commitment to pro bono service uh, began over 35 years ago when she and other members of the New Orleans Bar Association started the pro bono project of New Orleans. Uh, Judy's one of Legal Service Corporation's most enthusiastic supporters and advocates. And Judy, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Frank, and all of you for being here with us. Um, we are all in this together, and there is no greater demonstration of what we all know is the new reality than in what we see in the panelists and heard from the panelists just now, because resilience is our new reality. And as we are seeing that across legal services corporation grantees and at the helm of legal services corporations leadership through Ron and John and the board members, we are also seeing that same type of resilience across the legal profession and inspiring resilience from our courts at both the state and federal and municipal and the administrative law judge level. And what we know is that it's gonna take all of that and more. And the ABA is each and every day through its professional staff and volunteer leadership, stepping up to respond to the pandemic and think beyond on the new horizons of where we need to be in order to serve this ever growing population of those in need whom we are here to serve. What I can tell you is that since the start of the pandemic, we have been at the ABA working hard to not only serve our members, but to serve lawyers across the country, as well as the public. And when I hear cries for assistance from legal services corporation grantee directors on well-being and health to deal with the stress that these frontline heroes are dealing with, I urge you to take a look at the websites of the ABA because there we have resources on wellness, on how to reduce stress and working remotely, on how to work remotely, small video clips of how to use different applications to the best that you can in order to communicate with each other, to stay a part of a community, and most importantly, to stay connected to clients. There is an array of pandemic specific response webinars that have been put out free by the ABA as well as a host of CLEs uh, that are available for ABA members to take advantage of during this time of crisis. We know that a tidal wave of legal needs is coming our way and we have to do everything we can to be ready and respond. And what we know most importantly is that when we do it, these things together, when we, we address these crises that we're facing, when we do it together, courts, the legal profession, court administrators, and so many more, we can do the best job that we can for the public. And as a result, in the early days when the first stay-at-home orders were put in place, the American Bar Association established an ABA task force on legal needs arising out of the 2020 pandemic. I'm proud to tell you that President Emeritus of the Legal Services Corporation, Jim Sandman, without hesitation, when asked to chair that task force for the American Bar Association, stepped up. And he is joined by both ABA entities 
entities from near and far addressing all of these critical needs issues and the leaders of those entities, but the Conference of Chief Justices, the National Center for State Courts, COSCA, the court administrators, the administrative office of the courts, their lead for the pandemic response for all federal courts, NLADA, the National Association of District Attorneys, and so many more who understand the ABA's convening power and our desire to work with all of you to get this work done. And what we can tell you is that we've moved out not only in gathering in order to assure that the mission of the task force is met by, most importantly, identifying legal needs arising out of the pandemic, making recommendations to the American Bar and others about how to address those needs and mobilizing pro bono forces that we know and we've heard about today are going to be and are already so essential. But making sure that we work together so that we're not duplicating effort, that we're coordinating and collaborating on important issues, and I'll give you just a few examples. Number one, the ABA is coordinating and collaborating with Ring Central and we've stood up a national hotline, one number that'll be available when delivery of legal service, disaster legal services are put forth in states in response to major declarations. And we know that one hotline that'll re route people to their states will be critically important. Because now, as opposed to any other disaster we've faced, we have 50 states in our territories that are in need. Secondly, you will see, soon see the launch of an EIP navigator, a payment navigator, that will allow people to go on and understand better if they're eligible and whether in fact uh, they can in fact get these, the, these payments and take them to the portal where they can do so. That ABA EIP economic um, stimulus navigator will be very, very important uh, for people to be able to use. And lastly, of course, we're doing all we can to bring the voice to the legal profession together as we do every year, every year with ABA Day. This year going totally digital, ABA Day 2020, this very week. And all the lawyer leaders from across the country who assemble in Washington will be doing so again this year digitally. So what I can tell you is that the ABA is a part of this community. We applaud the leadership of the Legal Services Corporation and all that everyone is doing at all levels to assure that the people whom we're committed to serve are indeed served and that access to justice for all is an American reality and not just a dream. Thank you and know that the ABA is here with you. Uh, my name is Matthew Keenan and I serve on LSC's Board of Directors. It's now my honor to introduce Congressman Joe Kennedy III, who has represented Massachusetts' 4th District since 2013. Congressman Kennedy has been a champion of LSC and legal, civil legal aid. He's co-founded the Bipartisan Access to Civil Legal Services Caucus with Representative Susan Brooks and frequently speaks in support of LSC in the House and around the country. <clears throat> Uh, he's a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and prior to his election in Congress, he served as an assistant DA in Massachusetts. I believe we're ready for Representative Kennedy. Good morning, guys. How are you? Good. You got me? Great. <laughs> um, uh, I am so honored to, um, to be here with everybody today, wherever here may in fact be for uh, everyone. Uh, really um, uh, kudos to everybody for uh, adapting with the times and being able to find a way to make this all work um, from the era of social distancing and apologies if there's some um, additional shouts in the background here. Uh, we've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old that um, after a month of sheltering in place are not the best at um, listening to mom and dad anymore. So um, you might get some sound effects. So, so apologies and, and just ask your patients to bear with us. Um, but I want to start first of course by acknowledging uh, some of my colleagues that uh, without their work and without their advocacy and really their efforts to help translate uh, what legal service is all about to some of our uh, other colleagues that might not be as familiar with some of these issues or the extraordinary work that LSC and the partner organizations on the ground do we wouldn't have nearly the success that we have had uh, and really grateful for their work, um, particularly Representative Susan Brooks, Senator Dan Sullivan, who have been 
uh, great leaders uh, on this issue. And to my dear friend, uh, John, um, what extraordinary leadership you have shown over the course of your tenure on the board um, as its leader, as a dear friend uh, to me, and as someone who um, <laughs> I, I, I hope you take this the right way. The moment we end up having a, uh, I called him with good news about uh, an LSE appropriation figure. He said, hey, that's great. Why didn't you get more? <laughs> Which, John, it is the exact type of leadership uh, that we need, particularly at this moment. You are uh, indefatigable. You are tireless. You are a champion. And I am so grateful for all that you have done and continue to do. Uh, for LSC and for folks that need access uh, to justice. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think as we all can agree that this pandemic has become a diagnostic dive for the inequities, uh, structural, historical, uh, that trace through our system and revealing uh, its shortfalls throughout. Our justice system is absolutely no exception, uh, particularly when it comes to access to justice in our civil courts. And what's worse is that we know that as deep as this pain has been and will be for so many low-income people in our, our civil courts today, it's only going to get worse as this pandemic continues to spread. Already insufficient eviction moratoriums are going to end. Already insufficient rental assistance will be gone as state budgets deal with uh, catastrophes and, and gaping chasms the likes of which we have not seen in modern American history. Unemployment will may remain at historic levels with laid off workers fighting for justice. Medical debt collections will inevitably rise. Survivors of domestic violence will be searching for shelter and safety in the midst of already uh, extraordinary stresses of isolation. And an already overwhelmed civil legal justice system will help will help be held on the shoulders of already underfunded legal aid systems, uh, which will be in under e even greater stress. That's why we will once again, with John's help and all of the help, the help of all the others uh, on this conference and around the country, be doing everything we can, not just to advocate for maintaining critical LOC funding, but to expand it, to double it, to triple it, to make sure that in this time of crisis, those that need an advocate, that need help, that need legal assistance, that are falling to our legal system for that last utterance of fairness and justice, that they will be able to get access to it. So I'm here to join you with one very simple message, to thank you for the work that you've done, and to ask you to keep it going in every single one of your communities, to make good on that promise of equal justice under the law. And before you go off and mute me, which is one of the great benefits of um, doing these conferences by Zoom. Is that to say that our fight is clearly just beginning. We've got a long, long way ahead of us. I'm grateful for all of your efforts and advocacy and proud to call myself an ally and a friend. Thank you all so very much. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you very much. Um, I have another Congressman I get the privilege to introduce, uh, Fred Upton. Um, he represents Michigan's 6th District. Uh, Representative Upton serves as the co-chair of the Access to Civil Legal Services Caucus. He's also a member and former chair of the Committee on Energy and Commerce and serves as the top Republican leader of the Subcommittee on Energy. Prior to his election to Congress in 1987, Congressman Upton worked for President Reagan in the office of OMB. Representative Upton has long been an advocate for greater emphasis on biomedical research to improve public health and help launch the 21st Century Cures Initiative, a bipartisan effort to speed up the discovery and delivery of life-saving cures. Thank you for joining us, Representative Upton. The floor is now yours. Well, hey, thanks so much, John. And I'm sorry, our, my Zoom connection is not working. So, but maybe it's better that you're not looking at me because I feel uh, I'm a little bit like Joe, my good friend, Joe Kennedy, and that uh, it feels like I've been in a man cave uh, for the last uh, number of weeks, and I keep using my remote to try and find a Cubs game or a Michigan football game, and at least they're showing some highlights of when they actually win uh, over the last 100 years. So uh, any, anyway, uh, 
thanks for including me. Uh, Joe's been a, a great friend. Susan Brooks, uh, another one of our co-chairs, uh, has been stellar. Uh, we had some real success. Thanks, John, for getting it to our attention. I was one that, uh, in addition to, to others, signed the letter to make sure that we got $50 million in the emergency appropriation for LSC. Uh, so I signed that. Uh, obviously, we're going to be looking for additional funding in the next round as well. Uh, one of the things, of course, that it did was it established a new telework capacity building grant program. It's going to take $2 million of that $50 million, uh, immediately to grantees, uh, which is going to respond to client needs uh, as well as conduct court proceedings electronically if necessary. And, of course, as we travel around our districts, things are pretty well shut down. And so this is going to be a very essential component as we look at the legal process. But I got to say that the main reason that we needed uh, more uh, additional appropriations is uh, we're all having a tough time. I talked to some of my county commissioners and mayors uh, over the weekend, some of my state reps. Uh, I'm in constant communication with our, our governor. We have a divided government here in Michigan, just like we have it back in Washington as well. And the only way you're going to get things done is if you work together. And, of course, the trying times that we're seeing now dramatically reduced revenues. I mean, they in Michigan, uh, we now, uh, they delayed the uh, state income tax filing from April 15th until July. Uh, so that's two quarterly payments as well that are going to be moved back to July. Got property taxes and other things uh, that are going to be dramatically short uh, uh uh, from what they were anticipated early on. So revenue sharing, uh, to, which is a, an important state component to our counties, is probably not going to happen or re big reduced uh, rate. Uh, you, no sales tax revenue because virtually everything is shut down. All Most businesses are, are shut down here, at least for the next uh, week or two. R road tax, I mean, all those different things, those revenues are dramatically reduced. So if we're going to take care of the most vulnerable and really follow the line justice for all, we're going to have to step up at the national level, which is why it was so important that we got some money included in the CARES Act. Now, where are we? Uh, we're going to be looking at a phase four. Uh, when at Probably that first week of May. We're going to come back, I think, for a day or two this week. And we're going to make sure that the Paycheck Protection Plan, which has been widely successful, very bipartisan. As we all know, this was the $350 billion that was allocated for small businesses that, at least in my part of the state, was really leveraged by our community bankers and, and credit unions uh, to a large extent, but that ran out of money last week. So this would be another $250 billion on top of that, with another $60 billion for a total of 310 reserved for smaller community bank operations so that it's not taken all away maybe with one, one gobble by some of the large uh, guys like uh, Bank of America or J.P. Morgan or, or someone like that is my suspicion. That should pass, I think, before the end of the week, hopefully maybe today or tomorrow in the Senate and, and Wednesday or Thursday in the House. And then we'll move to that next phase, phase four, and that's where we'll be able to hopefully have some hearings. We'll be able to understand We'll all be coming back from all different parts of the country as to the impact of this terrible pandemic across the country and, and try to make uh, sense and, and work in a bipartisan basis to get it done. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, we know that lower income and minority communities that the LSC grantees serve are going to be disproportionately impacted by both the health and the economic impacts of this ongoing pandemic. And at least for me, and maybe I'm the old guy here on, on the call because I did uh, once work for President Reagan way before I, I ran for office. But I tell you, we've had uh, some stellar leaders on this, on both sides of the aisle. I, I learned a lot from Jim Ramstead, who some of you may remember back in the 90s uh, from Minnesota. He and I teamed up together and you know, we've been able to make sure that there have not been cutbacks on LSC funds. It's always had to be bipartisan. And I'm just glad to be with my friends who have stood with me to make sure that we have the votes uh, to get it done. And I appreciate being on the conference call today. And 
I just wish you all the, the best success and I, my door will always be open. You know, we got to stand up tall uh, for the people that we represent and the, the folks that otherwise would not have a door to the legal process, which as we know is so complex, whether it be dealing with, with, uh, uh, adoptions, whether it be with dealing with spousal abuse, I mean, all the different things, uh, the, the legal net, uh, we don't need to trap people in if they don't have decent representation. So I appreciate the job that all of you do. And with that, I'll be, I'll yield back and wish you the best. Well, thank you, Congressman. Uh, my name is John Malcolm. I'm on the uh, LSC's board uh, of directors. It's now my understanding that Senator Sullivan uh, has joined us and I had the distinct pleasure of introducing him. Uh, so throughout his career, uh, Senator Sullivan of Alaska has protected the most vulnerable members of his community. Uh, he sponsored the Pro Bono a Work to Empower and Represent Act of 2018, which promotes pro bono legal services to empower survivors of domestic violence. Uh, before entering Congress, Senator Sullivan was Alaska's Attorney General and actively worked to combat the state's high rates of sexual violence through his Choose Respect campaign. Uh, after graduating from Georgetown Law School, he went on to clerk for the Chief Justice of the Alaskan Supreme Court uh, and for two very distinguished federal appellate judge, judges, Andrew Kleinfeld on the Ninth Circuit uh, and James Buckley on the D.C. Circuit. Uh, he also has a very distinguished record of military uh, and national security service, and you'll have to take my word for it when I tell you that that is an extreme understatement. Uh, Senator Sullivan, we are delighted that you could join us and look forward to your remarks. Well, thank you, John, and uh, thanks to my uh, members of Congress, colleagues Fred Upton and Joe Kennedy, who are champions um, on all that the Legal Services Corporation does. And um, I think it's really important to know that you have a lot of bipartisan supporters here. And um, we all know that you guys are on the front lines of uh, equal justice for all. I wanna do a quick shout out. I don't know if she's on the call, but Nicole Nelson, uh, who runs our Alaska Legal Services for my state in Alaska. She she does a great job. And as um, Fred and Joe have uh, indicated, I think the pandemic that we are all uh, struggling through and certainly working hard to get through uh, has highlighted the important need of all the work that uh, LSC does and that all our members on the on the call here today do for our fellow Americans. It's, um, you know, when you look at, uh, unfortunately, there's always, always these kind of crises, 90, what we call in the Marine Corps, the, you know, the 10%, right? There's 90% who are always doing great stuff. And in this pandemic, it's probably 99%. Uh, working together, sacrificing with each other, helping their neighbor out. But unfortunately, we always have a couple uh, folks out there who try to take advantage of um, these kind of situations, unscrupulous actors who are, uh, you know, trying to take advantage of seniors or scamming people with fake SBA loans and emails. So we're, we know that that kind of issues are going to increase and the work that you do in that regard. And um, an issue that I care about, I think all of you care deeply about, but as John mentioned, the, uh, the issues of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, you know, we're hearing reports that these uh, rates are going up in our country. And that's of course heartbreaking, horrifying, and um, the fact that we were in some ways able to anticipate that the pandemic, as Joe mentioned, is going to negatively impact uh, our low income communities who need these services more than ever. A number of us uh, thought it was appropriate to make sure the CARES Act had some funding, the 50 million, which I think is a good start. Another of 
uh, several other programs that I think many of you uh, are probably aware of with regard to food assistance and SNAP and others were actually part of phase two and phase three, the CARES Act. So we are, we and I say we collectively, Democrats and Republicans are going to continue to focus on the important work that you that you all do and fund it. And I will say that, and, and John touched on it, but I, I want to go into a little bit more detail because you need to kind of highlight the good news stories occasionally too. Uh, as, as he mentioned, um, we were able to pass the POWER Act, that was the pro bono to work and represent act uh, in 2018. And uh, Joe Kennedy was the champion in the house. And what I wanted to do was report, so that was, the, that was actually modeled on something I worked on when I was attorney general in Alaska as part, as John mentioned, our choose respect strategy. But the whole idea here was to get our chief judges in each district in the country to promote a pro bono legal services uh, summit, as we call them in Alaska, to encourage people to volunteer to do pro bono work with their local legal services corporation to do that work for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. That was the goal. They're supposed to report back to Congress. They did report back at the end of the year. And um, every judicial district in the country, uh, pursuant to the uh, Power Act, with the exception of four, and Joe and I politely wrote a letter to the four, reminding them that, you know, you're a chief judge of a federal district. You can't uh, ignore the law. Maybe they just didn't see it. But um, uh, held one of these summits, at least one, and over 100 public events, with many of you, I'm sure, participating. And here's the good news. Over 7,000 advocates and survivors attended these summits uh, nationwide. The whole goal of the Power Act when we wrote it was to envision an army of lawyers across the country donating their time and talent to represent victims and survivors of domestic abuse. So many of you were part of it. Uh, that was our first year and we, we had advocates and survivors of over 7,000 Americans. So I would call that a pretty good uh, indicator of our collective success. I want to thank Congressman Joe Kennedy again on the House side, who was the great champion. Susan Brooks also was. Don Young, Tulsi Garrett brought together a bunch of folks. I think we can do more. I have legislation with uh, uh, Senator Harris of California that essentially goes to the heart of one aspect of our justice system that I think is fundamentally unfair. If you're a perpetrator of these kind of crimes, let's say a rapist or a stalker, and you get indicted, the federal government or the state government gets you a lawyer. You get a right to counsel, Sixth Amendment right to counsel, that's under the Constitution. But if you're the survivor of that crime, you get nothing. You might get something through LSC and the Power Act, but in general, you get nothing. So our next goal will be to fix that. And if an indicted uh, abuser gets a lawyer, then we think through volunteer, but also federal funding, so should the victim. So we'll be working with that together, all of you, to correct this injustice once we get through this pandemic, which we will. But I want to thank everybody here, my fellow members of Congress, and all of you for the great work and advocacy that you continue to do on these issues that are going to be more important than ever. So thanks again, John. Appreciate the opportunity to say a few words and uh, keep up the great work. Thank you, Senator Sullivan, and thank you, Representatives Upton and Kennedy.
Uh, I'm Ron Flagg, and it's my privilege this morning to moderate our panel on the effect of COVID-19 on our state courts. I am joined by four distinguished jurists, uh, Chief Justice Jeffrey Bivens of Tennessee, Chief Justice Connie Cantil Saka Uwe of California, Chief Justice Nathan Hecht of Texas. Chief Justice Hecht is also the president of the Conference of Chief Justices and Chief Justice Bridget McCormick of Michigan. I had more to say about them, but in the interest of time, let's get right to the questions. Uh, I'd like to direct the first question to Chief Justices Kantil Saka Uwe and uh, Chief Justice Bivens, and that is, how has the COVID-19 public health crisis affected your state courts, particularly for low-income litigants? Thank you. Thank you to LSC and our congressional leaders for your leadership and your strategy, particularly during this very trying time. In California, our state courts are severely impacted, like the state courts of my fellow chiefs on the call today. Uh, we've had two interesting, I would say, uh, developments. And the first is that our governor early on delegated to me and my judicial counsel all authority to suspend state law during the COVID virus. And at the same time, the courts recognized our need to contract and shrink because of, of our staff and our judges. So all courts in California are operating on skeletal staffs in person as well as a few judges who are there in person with a lot of telework going on. So with this new authority by the governor, one of the first things we did, thanks to the communication and leadership of our legal aid community, is one of the first things we did was try to reduce foot traffic. And so we looked to what the governor's policies were, what the stay at home place, shelter in place orders were. And so one of the first things we did was we suspended all rent eviction uh, hearings and all judicial uh, mortgage foreclosure hearings. In an effort to keep people in their homes during the crisis and during the emergency, but also to reduce the foot traffic and the use of our judges and staff. And also because our really expansive self-help program is basically inoperable now because we don't have anyone who can assist these poor folks in fighting these or defending these eviction cases. The second thing that we did, thanks to information from the legal aid community, is we extended temporary restraining orders and permanent injunctions beyond their life now as they exist to 90 days after the governor has lifted the state of emergency, understanding that any time the Judicial Council could make yet another rule that would change those timeframes. We also at this point included the concerns of family law. So we changed visitation, we changed ex parte orders to ensure that if people could not get to court or for some reason could not contact attorneys, we suspended all statutes of limitations and we ensured that all hearings be conducted remotely when possible. Now for all these rules, there are good cause exceptions, but we require the court to state on the record the good cause to go around uh, these orders. And in so doing, we continue to modify and clarify these rules because we're getting information from the legal aid community in real time. Thankfully, our governor has taken a number of steps like extending health care to uh, low income workers, extending unemployment, increasing unemployment, eliminating the red tape for application for unemployment, that together as a package is focused on helping low income folks as we in the courts intend to find a way to at least facilitate these policies to the point that they assist the court in ensuring access to justice for core subject matter. Chief Justice Bivens. Thank you very much, Ron, for having us here. It, it obviously, COVID-19 has had a huge impact on our court systems here in Tennessee as well. Uh, as the Chief Justice in California has indicated, we have taken, we in Tennessee have taken a number of similar steps that she mentioned. We, and we entered our first order on March the 13th of this year which was an order declaring a state of emergency in the judicial branch of government 
subsequent to the governor declaring a state of emergency as well. In Tennessee, we have a statute that allows the courts, uh, particularly the, the Chief Justice, to suspend statutes of limitation, statutes of repose, and other statutes in time of a disaster. And of course, our order put, uh, put deemed the COVID-19 situation to be the equivalent of a disaster and started exercising our powers in that regard. In, in addition to extending statutes of limitations and statutes of repose, we also uh, made specific exceptions to our order that limited in-person court proceedings to allow for uh, the hearing of uh, orders of protection. Also, we extended existing orders of protection to, to uh, about a week past the end date of the state of emergency for the, for the judicial branch. On March 25th, we issued a second order. The first order was scheduled to expire on March 31st. On March the 25th, we entered a second order that runs through April the 30th. Uh, in that order, we continued those provisions as well as adding a provision that uh, stayed in directing the courts not to take any action on residential evictions. Uh, in Tennessee, the most all foreclosures are done through a non-judicial means, so we did not take the step uh, as a judiciary of addressing uh, that the foreclosure side, but we did take the step uh, on residential evictions. So those have ceased and will continue to cease uh, under our order. Additionally, we have tried to make clear time after time that our courts are open. They are not closed to any extent. And of course, that, that's a huge issue with regard to serving the low income population and the clientele of legal services. What we were concerned about was even if courthouses themselves are quote unquote closed, we have instructed and directed our clerk's offices to find a way to remain open, have drop boxes, have email contacts, and things of that nature. We hope, uh, and we are monitoring that. In fact, we have taken steps on a number of occasions to uh, address issues when that does not look like what is happening. But obviously, it still is a great impact out there. Uh, as many folks have noted, the issue of the dramatic increase once the eviction limitation is relieved, all those are issues that we face and, and are going to have to deal with going forward. But we have tried to make every effort to look at ways in which we can make this as best as possible. We have gone to great lengths to allow video testimony, video filings, fax filings, email filings. We have suspended a number of, any number of rules and statutes that would inhibit that type of an approach. So hopefully we're trying, are doing uh, some benefit to that and hopefully we'll be able to do that as we go because as all of us know, we are continuing to address this on a day-by-day -day basis because we have never seen anything like this before and hope we don't see anything like this again for a long time to come. Thank you. Uh, Chief Justice Heck, uh, you serve as the president of the Conference of Chief Justices. And from that perspective, can you tell us, talk to us about the uh, communications among the Chief Justices and other justices of the state Supreme Courts and the uh, administrators of the various courts across the country? And relatedly, can you tell us about the operating status of the courts around the country? Are they open for business, operating remotely? Thanks, Ron. Um, <clears throat> thanks for everyone uh, uh, participating in this. Uh, just to give you a word of background, uh, there is a conference of chief justices uh, composed of the uh, highest judicial officers at uh, in each state and territory in the District of Columbia. Uh, there is a corresponding group of uh, state court administrators, the leading administrator in each of those jurisdictions, uh, and they are helped uh, together by um, the National Center for State Courts, which has existed for almost 50 years in uh, trying to support state courts with research, communication, 
uh, outreach, uh, acquiring information, uh, making it available to uh, all of the courts and people who are working with us. <clears throat> so from the very beginning, um, the National Center uh, began to gather uh, the orders that uh, the Chief Justice uh, Contil Sakari and Chief Justice Bivens have talked about, orders from all of the uh, states. State jurisdictions are different, and so you can uh, expect that the orders will be different, and it's important that when a jurisdiction is considering what to do in its own circumstances, that they have uh, available to them uh, what other states have done, uh, ideas to share, uh, that kind of information. So the National Center immediately began gathering all of that. Uh, it, um, the Conference of Chief Justices immediately formed a rapid response team uh, that I and the Chief Judge of New York and the Chief Judge of Maryland are on, as well as state court administrators from Rhode Island, Texas, and Nebraska. Uh, and, <clears throat> and meeting um, by uh, teleconference uh, uh, as often as we needed to, uh, multiple times a week, uh, to talk about what was going on in various different jurisdictions and to try to look at what problems needed to be addressed and how to do that. Uh, and as we've done that, uh, we've also begun to look on down the road uh, and we formed a post-pandemic planning group uh, that will begin to look at uh, what's on the back side of this? How are we going to um, get through it? And what will things look like when we do? I'll just uh, highlight two things um, that uh, my colleagues uh, have already uh, uh, noted in, in their uh, comments. Uh, one of them is it's really important in all of this uh, to be sure that you're hearing from uh, the troops from the from the people on the ground uh, about what the realities are and what will really help. And so uh, we're encouraging um, chief justices and administrators around the country uh, to be in contact uh, with legal aid providers uh, to find out, uh, for example, with residential uh, evictions or with uh, uh, debt enforcement and collections, uh, what can really help. Uh, and to try to get um, um, brokered solutions uh, involving all parties who are interested in those issues uh, rather than uh, simply uh, just uh, telling everybody what to do. Uh, so we've, we've been working very hard uh, on that. Uh, and uh, another thing that um, I think my colleague in New York started uh, and we're trying to follow here in Texas and others are as well, <clears throat> is um, when we get into a position where we're trying to dig out, as everyone has noted this morning, uh, there's going to be an awful backlog, uh, lots of cases to uh, tend to, and how are we going to get um, uh, resources, legal uh, counsel to deal with all of that? And one way we want to uh, do is to get the a bar, the state bar, and uh, legal aid providers um, to work uh, one more time to really encourage pro bono representation as a as really a, a patriotic and a a, 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 a strong uh, need uh, for the legal profession uh, as we begin to uh, move forward. But I'm pleased to tell you that the uh, chiefs in every state. Um, in all the states uh, are working very hard at all of these things. Uh, and uh, as uh, Chief Justice Bivens said, the courts are open uh, and we wanna make sure that, uh, that people know that. Thank you, Chief. Chief Justice McCormick, court employees and judges are in a sense first responders for individuals who experience mental health, addiction, and domestic violence issues. Could you talk to us today about the, how the courts have to deal with crisis situations at a time when state court budgets will likely be reduced because of the economic crisis? 
Absolutely. Thank you for including me in this conversation and thanks to um, Legal Services as always for the leadership on pulling us together to talk about what is going to be a critical question for our courts um, as we go through the pandemic and afterwards. And I'm uh, grateful to my friends, John Levy, and uh, looking forward to meeting you in person, Ron, um, and uh, very grateful for all the friendship. And, and to Chief Justice Heck for his leadership throughout this. As he said, um, he has been, and the National Center has been, um, uh, quick to gather all of the resources available for all of us, connect us, um, and keep us up to date, and it's uh, quite helpful. I find myself talking to my Chief Justice colleagues more than usual. Um, uh, the Chief Justice from Indiana and the Chief Justice from Ohio, my bordering states, and I now have weekly Zoom meetings just to um, exchange ideas, and in a way, uh, we're, I, I, that's one of the one of the bright line, bright spots here is we're we're talking more and, and uh, sharing ideas more. But you're right, um, courts are already the first responders in many of our community's largest problems um, in the opioid epidemic, the mental health crises, domestic violence. Our court. Our, our judges in our trial courts and their staffs have been first responders for some time now on all of those questions and all of those issues. Um, and all of those are only harder now. Uh, you heard from the legal services providers who joined the call um, earlier about how we're going to see spikes in um, eviction cases, debt collection cases, um, domestic violence issues, which are gonna show up in all different kinds of cases, not just PPO questions, but family court cases and some criminal cases. Um, and it is also the case, um, as we heard from our friends in Congress, that um, budgets are clearly gonna be impacted by this um, pandemic, state budgets in particular. Um, we, unlike the federal government, we can't print money in our states. And so um, those, uh, budget issues are going to be hitting us incredibly quickly, um, and that's and that's a, and that's a problem um, because we're going to have more work to do with fewer resources. Um, and I've I've said all along that that means we're going to have to get um, creative about how we do that work. And already our judges and their staff um, are doing that now. Uh, but I think there's uh, there's quite an opportunity here for us to rethink how it is um, we do business in, in especially these areas where courts are the frontline mental health workers, addiction crisis workers, um, and domestic violence um, crisis workers. Um, I, I, I can say more about that uh, later, in the, later in the interview, um, but, but I believe we're gonna see a surge in all of those cases and it's gonna, it's gonna force us to reevaluate how it is we do business. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more round of questions uh, for uh, each of two pairs. If each of you could take two minutes uh, for the following questions, starting with uh, Chief Justices Cantil Saka Uwe and uh, Chief Justice Heck. Uh, we went through a severe recession starting in 2008. How did that recession affect your courts and how do you anticipate the courts will experience uh, the current uh, crisis? Thank you, Ron. I came in as Chief Justice in the early part of that great recession. And I can tell you, as we all know here on this panel, that in the midst of the cuts and the reductions, uh, judicial branches engaged in furloughs. We in California closed hundreds and hundreds of courtrooms. We closed uh, many, many, many courthouses. We shrunk access. And frankly, the brunt of that fell upon civil justice and it fell upon evenly big law and also pro se litigants. Civil was just squeezed out of the picture because of the fact of all of the constitutional timeline and dimensions that we've all talked about. And secondly, though, I would say, I think this reduction will be, and this recession will be different, because at least in California, with the delayed payment of income taxes, we are looking at, and we've been warned, at least two consecutive reductions during the summer. 
So that affects our ability to plan because we'll be reduced for the first uh, budget in July. And we know we'll be reduced again in August once the true taxes come in for California on which our state budget is perilously built. And so we know though now we are working with our civil counterparts, our civil litigants and our civil attorneys, and we're managing expectations. And for those who weren't active in the recession and those who were, we're calling on the leadership again and we're saying, come to us with a plan that will triage how and in what order we should be hearing civil cases. Because during the Great Recession, there was an uproar, but now we know each other and now we know what this looks like. And it may not be exactly the same, but we know that we can at this front end start to look at how we can get through it. So we aren't in the legislature pointing fingers and fighting over a zero sum uh, revenue pie. And the same is true with criminal. We talk to our public defenders and our DAs statewide, and we say we need to come together on a plan because if we don't plan this, the legislature will tell us how to do it. So we're really looking, to, uh, looking at old partnerships and long conversations, hard news, but getting through it, as so many of my chiefs have said here today. Thank you. Uh, Chief Justice Ash. Oh, um, uh, the uh, 2008 slowdown recession uh, did not impact Texas very much um, and did not uh, impact uh, the courts very much uh, because uh, oil prices uh, remain strong through most of the time. Uh, it did uh, severely impact um, legal aid because IOTA went from $25 million a year to ze almost zero uh, because of interest rates. Um, there was a silver lining in that uh, because it prompted us to go to a legislature and ask them to help make up part of that. And they did, they made up half of it and they continued to do that uh, ever since. So that was really the begin beginning of uh, state funding in Texas for legal aid. Um, but I think this time is going to be a lot worse um, for us. Um, and uh, because now oil prices are at record lows, uh, as well as unemployment rising and all of the economic uh, factors uh, that are pressures that are building. Um, so we're going to, the courts are going to have to work, uh, work on uh, how to make uh, bricks without straw uh, and uh, to be more efficient. Uh, we're already beginning to look at ways uh, that we can uh, do that. Uh, we're going to have to find ways to get back to jury trials at some point, uh, and that's going to be uh, a big challenge. Uh, but we're, we're at least trying to plan and try to look ahead. Um, I'm anticipating uh, a rough legislative session next year uh, when our legislature meets the next time uh, and budgets are going to be strapped. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we really uh, have some uh, challenges ahead of us. But um, the judiciary uh, here, uh, like in the other states, uh, intends to work very hard uh, to try to show that we're like the rest of the government, we're trying to get through this uh, for the good of the people. But it's, um, I think it's going to be a tough uh, battle. Final question. Thank you, Chief. Uh, uh, Chief Justices McCormick and Bivens. Uh, Chief Justice Heck mentioned a silver lining out of the last crisis. One silver lining in this crisis is the increased use of technology and other creative solutions to increase access to the courts. Have your courts found alternative ways to serve litigants that you might continue to use after the immediate pinch ends? Uh, thank you for this question. I think this is, I, I, I say um, often that this crisis um, might not have been the disruption we wanted, but it was the disruption we needed. Um, before we had a pandemic, as uh, the folks on this court know, we had, a, we had an access to justice, cri justice crisis, and we were working on how we could bridge the civil justice gap, but it was you know, bigger than a gap. Um, my state is 14 months into a um, planning, uh, justice for all planning process. Uh, 
it just got more urgent, not less urgent. Um, we, we are already doing business differently in all of our courts. Um, our judges throughout the state all had Zoom licenses. Uh, we, bought the, we bought them Zoom licenses like, over a year ago. We got all the magistrates and referees Zoom licenses. They are holding hearings by Zoom and live streaming them to YouTube all over the state. They're doing that in Texas as well. You can go on our website and the Texas Supreme Court websites and click on the links to those hearings and watch them so the public has access to what's happening. Um, so the courts are already figuring out uh, how to do business differently and learning months worth of new lessons every day, which is fantastic. Um, it's again, the disruption we needed. Um, but that doesn't necessarily answer the question of making sure everybody is included in these changes. Um, and that's important too. But I feel like this is going to give us an opportunity to think bigger and grander um, about what that looks like. Um, uh, there are already ways in which we are working with the legal aid services providers in our state to make sure folks um, who don't have access to lawyers can access these new processes. Um, we're going to do a series of short videos. Um, if, if you don't know how to um, do something, you go to YouTube and figure it out. We're going to do a series of short videos. I'm going to do them. So are legal services providers to tell self-represented litigants how they can um, get help during this time and after. Um, I, I believe there is a tremendous opportunity for us to think differently about all of the forces that have kept us from updating what we do and how we do it to meet the needs of more people and everybody in this country who, who is entitled to the same justice. And that to me is um, the big fat silver, silver lining of this whole thing. Thank you. Chief Justice Bivens, you get the last word. All right. Thank you so much, Ron, for uh, LC putting this together. It's been a, a great honor to participate in this. And I think we've all learned a lot. And as we always do, when we have a chance to share with others. I would very much agree with Chief Justice McCormick. You did too. It truly is a civil line, a, a civil line here. You said. You said my eyes. Of what we were seeing. And obviously the video conferencing is one of the biggest issues. I don't, I, we were not as well prepared initially for the video conferencing as we were, but our AOC has jumped in very quickly and very efficiently and allowed that now to where we're having video conferencing all across Tennessee in all courts at all levels. And I certainly hope and in, in fact intend for us to continue using that. And that does include our appellate courts. Uh, our, Supreme, our, our court, the Tennessee Supreme Court has already had an oral argument by video conference and we intend to do that again uh, for the month of May. So there are great, opportunities there. One of the other areas that we think uh, we is being emphasized again for us is not technically in the court system, but it's to help with those individuals who have legal issues. And that's our utilization of free legal answers uh, network. Uh, as, as many of us have, have uh, free legal answers available. It's a program where uh, folks are will send in a question to our legal services folks. And there are lawyers across our state who volunteer to go in then and take those questions and answer those questions. We've seen a very significant increase already in the use of free legal answers and the ability of lawyers across the state to help out folks, particularly those, uh, and these are targeted for low income individuals that have legal problems and may not even know they have legal problems. We have emphasized more use of the telephone in that in that regard. Now, one of the other areas that I, that's been touched on a little bit here, it's also something I think we can gain from this, is the uh, use of remote wit uh, notarization and witnessing through this. I think this can help a, a lot of issues as well. I know our, our governor, uh, at our behest, issued an executive order that now allows for uh, remote notarization and witnessing, which helps for planning and things of that nature. So we, we have tried to do that. And, and I know that our Tennessee Bar Association is looking at uh, pushing legislation in our legislature the next time they're in session to address this on an uh, ongoing basis. So I think that we have to be willing to adjust. We, we do have a change, as Justice McCormick, Chief Justice McCormick said, 
this is a situation where we, we're learning something every day. But we've got to remember and learn the lessons from this and take those lessons that we have from this and make our justice system better and more efficient as we go forward. Thank you. And I want to thank all of our uh, Chief Justices, not only for being here today, but for all of the work that you and your colleagues around the country are doing so uh, diligently and creatively. And now it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce our closing speaker, Ken Frazier. Ken serves as co-chair of LSC's Leaders Council. Ken has served as chairman of the board and CEO of Merck and Company since 2011. Before that, he served as Mark Merck's president and general counsel, and before that, as a partner with Drinker, Fiddle, and Reef. Throughout his career, Ken has actively lived out his commitment of access to justice. He is a true champion for holding America to its promise of equal justice under law. Ken? Okay, thank you. I'd also like to offer my profound thanks to the LSC board for convening this important briefing under extremely difficult circumstances. I'd especially like to thank the distinguished members of Congress, the chief justices and other leaders from the judiciary, legal and legal aid communities for their powerful and informative remarks. They are shining a light on the alarming fact that COVID-19 is not just a public health crisis not just an economic crisis, but a serious crisis for our justice system. The pandemic could in fact spark a surge in demand, in fact, it's likely to spark a surge in demand that could overwhelm our civil justice system if we don't act. We heard from remarkable LSC grantees who are acting using technology and reforming procedures to adjust to these new challenges and of course, four extraordinary state court chief justices who are doing the same in their courts. We've learned from the president of the ABA that they are stepping up with a COVID task force. And we heard words of support from a leading senator and two members of Congress. As this briefing illustrates, LSC is fully committed to meeting the pandemic challenge with the new funding it just received and with the much needed additional funding it is seeking. If you allow me to say this, I believe that this pandemic will fundamentally change how our country operates on many levels. And the justice system, of course, is an indispensable element of what makes our democracy work. As co-chair with Harriet Myers of LSC's Leaders Council, I can assure you that we understand the gravity of the crisis and will put our shoulder to the wheel as well. The pandemic crisis will require the best from all of us. And fortunately, we are a community that is used to delivering just that. So thank you. Please stay safe and please be well. Thank you, Ken. Final word. I just want to thank, say thank you to all of, all of you for joining us today. We are currently facing what I believe is the most challenging moment in the history of legal aid in America. As you've heard today, the 132 legal aid programs that LSC fund are facing this moment with courage, with diligence, with dedication, and with ingenuity. This is a moment for all of us to step forward and support them in their work. Thank you again, stay safe, be well.